basis and dimension. If you have a vector space and in it you find vectors say v1 and vector v2 up to say vector vn and so we have set v1 v2 up to vn and say so you do some work and then say you find that v1 v2 vn are linearly independent. Like what we just did, right? Hey, here's some vector. So here's some functions, if it's continuous functional phase, space. This is some polynomials, so if it's a polynomial space like P4, or P3, right? Uh, here's some vectors, because it's R5. So you have your space, you have some vectors that you're given, and you've done your test, and you've shown that they're linearly independent. The second thing that you notice is that when you calculated the span of these guys, it ends up being the entire vector space, which means it is a spanning set. Okay, is this interesting? So we went through a problem and I gave you some vectors and you did your test, you found they were linearly independent. And then you said, well, I need to find the span. And actually, how would you do this one? How do you do that test? C1, V1, C2, V2, C3, V3, right? Add them all up, equal to zero, solve it. Only test trivial solution. How'd you choose to solve it? What's your space? Figure it out. It's continuous here. I have to use a round skin or something. Oh, no, no, no. It's just normal vectors. Oh, is it square? Yeah, then use a determinant. It's non square? Solve it. <laughs> it's a system of equations. You've got to solve it. Right? And you have to say, oh, it only has a trivial solution. Okay, they're linearly independent. Okay, so that's how you do the first problem. How would you do the second one? Well, you do the second one by doing what? you would simply say that, what is the span? It's something times the first plus something times the second plus something times the last equals, and then what do you have to have on this side? A representation of everywhere, right? For example, um, if it's P3, what would be the representation of everywhere in P3? A plus BX plus CX squared. That represents every polynomial of three terms. Why? Because I didn't tell you what A, B, and C were. What would be everywhere in R4? A, B, C, D. With four coordinates. <laughs> that represents everywhere. What are the coordinates? I'm not going to tell you. Everywhere. Is everybody okay with this? And then what did you do? Solve. It's like, is it possible to get everywhere? Is there a solution? If the answer is yes, there's a solution, it's a spanning set. In other words, if you told me specifically one of those values Right? I could figure out what coordinates I need, right? Well, how much of each I need to get to there. In other words, solve it. If it has a solution, it spans. So I have those two problems. So <coughs> let's say you showed independence and you showed spanning set. Let's try something. I'll do one. So, example. 
V1 is equal to 1, 1, 0. V2 is equal to 0, 0, 1. And D3 is equal to um, 1, 0, So the first thing I'm going to check, linearly independent. These are obviously in what vector space? There are three, because there's three coordinates. If I have three vectors in R3, what's the quickest check? Determinant. Because when you set it up, it would end up being, oh look, the vector's over here, I'm just going to calculate the determinant because it's square. So the fastest check here is that one theorem is right. I don't have to actually, setting up the problem is actually creating the matrix 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. And then it would be this whole constants and zeros on the other side. It's like, look, that's just calculate the determinant. That's all I need to do. What is the determinant of this? Well, it would be the determinant of, let's just do some row ops. Let's take row 2 minus row 1. What would you get? Are we okay with that? Now, if I would switch the order of row 2 and row 3, what did I do to my determinant? It's a negative of the determinant. Now, why did I do that? Triangular. Triangular. What's its determinant? Negative 1 times negative 1. So what's its answer? 1. Which, by the way, is not zero. So, yes, these are linearly independent. None of the vectors is some linear combination of the other vectors. They're actually linearly independent. Okay. Um, B. Are they a spanning set? What does it mean to be a spanning set? It says. Alpha times the first plus something times the second plus something times the third can possibly go everywhere. Is this possible? That you can go to any possible location in three space. What does that look like? That looks like alpha one plus alpha three is supposed to be A. It looks like alpha one is supposed to be B. And it looks like alpha 2 plus alpha 3 is supposed to be C. Well, if alpha 1 is B, what does that make alpha 3? A minus B. And if alpha 3 is A minus B, what does that make alpha 2? C plus B minus A, right? So this here was A minus B, bring it across. So C plus B minus A. So does it have a solution? If you told me A, B, and C, could I find alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3? Hey, what? how do you go to 1, 1, 1? You need zero of those. You need one of those. And then... Sorry, that was alpha two, alpha one, sorry. One of those, and actually that one's one, too. So that would one of these, one of these, and none of these will go to one, one, one. Is everybody okay with that? So what have I found? 
They're linearly independent, and they span all of R3. It, now comes the question, is that special? Well, there's two theorems that will show up to allow us to say, yeah, this is actually kind of a useful thing. The first theorem. If you have some vectors, and this is a spanning set, of a vector space, then any collection of more than n vectors in V are linearly dependent. So if you give me a spanning set, any set at all that has more than that has to have linearly dependence. So what would that mean, for example, on our problem? How many vectors do I have? Three. Is it a spanning set? Yes. Well, what if I had a set that spanned V and it used five vectors? There's dependence here, right? In other words, what this allows you to do is once you find a spanning set, anything that has more than that is dependent. Right? There's some dependence that occurs whenever you try to have more. They don't stay linearly independent. If you span, anything that you add is not new. It's just going to be a combination of one of your other vectors that you've already known. So that allows to say don't worry about going up. There's a corollary to this, to the, though, Ugh. which is if both, say, V1 to Vn, let's see, have n vectors, and somebody else shows up to class, and they said, no, no, I found m vectors. So one person walked into class and said, hey, I found a set, and they are linearly independent and span V. So one person walked in with his set of vectors V, and he says, hey, mine are linearly independent, and they actually span all of V. Another person walks in and says, oh, mine are linearly independent, and mine span all of V. then what happens is what we do know is that they have the same amount of vectors. So what was the unique property? have the same number of vectors. So if one person could find a spanning set that's linearly independent, and another person finds a completely different spanning set that's linearly independent, there's one thing that's always true. They'll have the same number of vectors. So for my problem in R3, I found that 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1 were linearly independent and they span all of R3. Somebody else shows up and finds 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1 are linearly independent and span all of R3. Somebody else shows up and finds 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Those are linearly independent and they span all of R3. But the one thing that's always going to be true is that there's going to be Three, and that seems to be that's a property 
of the vector space. So it's not the vectors that span it. It's the ve what's unique to this space is how many vectors are needed to span it. You need three of them. And so that's a special thing of the space. We'll give it its own name, and we'll call it its dimension. And the set of vectors that can do it are going to be called a basis. So, a basis set V1, V2, Vn of a vector space are linearly independent and they span V. So it's a spanning set of linearly independent vectors. So we call such a thing a basis set. The only thing that's true universally about basis sets for any vector space is how many there are. Not what they are, just that how many there are. And so because the number of vectors in any basis set of a vector space is unique. We call that the dimension of B. So our example above 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, what was it? 1, 0, 1? Was that right? 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Got that wrong. Our a basis of R3, and this is important, they're a basis. There is no such thing as the basis. They're a basis. There are three vectors that can be used to go everywhere. There's actually uncountably infinite number of bases, right? What we do know, though, is how many vectors are necessary. So the dimension of R3 is 3. It's three dimensions. <coughs> That's what we call three dimensional space. <coughs> Special case. Note the dimension of the set that only contains the origin. Right? Is this a vector space? Yes. It contains the zero object. It's not empty. And if you stretch the zero object, it's still a zero object. If you add the zero object to the zero object, it's zero object. It's closed, right? So it is a vector space. This is the only one that has dimension zero. <coughs> so the real numbers themselves would be of dimension one. Right? Because a real number times a real number is real. A real number plus a real number is real. It's closed. Addition and scalar multiplication is still has all has the properties of so commutativity, associativity, additive ad identity, additive inverse, multipli multiplicative, associative, distributive property, and that one times a real is still the same real. Right? It's a vector space. And what do we normally use to span the real numbers? One, right? That's the that's our normal unit dimension. It's the thing that's given to us to generate things. So from there on out, we go two-dimensional, three-dimensional, etc. Um, another note: 
if the basis set is finite, which means you go through here and it's actually some countable number from zero to whatever. It's like, what's your, oh, I need 15 vectors that are all linearly independent. They span my vector space. Oh, that's the 15th dimension, right? The, the 15th dimensional vector space. So if you go through here and you have a fixed number of vectors needed, it's, we would then say that the space is of finite dimension. But what happens to something like this? Say P is the set of, this is important, all polynomials. So any polynomial at all, which would mean it's just things like what? X to the 0, X to the 1, X to the 2, X to the 3, 2, however high you want to go. I have terms, it's constants times x is being raised to integer powers, where the power is 0, 1, 2, whatever. And that's a polynomial. And I'm just going to collect all of those. So what's my box of stuff? Polynomials, all of them, that could ever possibly exist. Now my question is, do you think the building blocks, could I make all polynomials from a finite number of polynomials? So if I have a few polynomials, I could multiply them and add them and somehow make all polynomials. Some people, some people are saying yes, some people are saying no. Well, if it's true, right? So if, let's just make a guess. Let's guess that the dimension of P is finite. And let's call it N. It's like, I don't know which polynomials, but if I say it's finite, I have a certain number of polynomials. Now, there's a theorem that says that, you know, if the dimension is finite and it's n, that would mean that how many vectors are needed to go everywhere? n. What would ever happen if I had more than that? The new stuff would actually be what? Linearly dependent. So any more than that, any set more than that would have to be linearly dependent. So by theorem, any more than three must be linearly dependent. Okay. So consider one x, x squared, x cubed, up to x to the n. How many poly are those all polynomials? Yes. How many are there? There's n plus one polynomials here. Let's check. All right, the theorem says if if we had any more than whatever you said, so uh, hey, if you tell me n, I'll just pick n plus one by just picking these guys. It's like, okay. Then they have to be dependent. All right, those are polynomials, but polynomials are continuous functions. They're infinitely continuous, right? They're really, really smooth because all the derivatives are here. So what should I test for independence? What technique? I should use the Ronskian. So let's check, all right? Let's check for independence by using Ronskian. How do you do that? For every one of these guys, I make a determinant matrix, right? And what do I do? What's the next row? Take derivatives. What's the next row? Take derivatives. What's the next row? 
Take derivatives. Anybody catch what's going on here? That's three factorial. N, N minus one, X to the N minus three. If I keep on going, what's over here? All zeros until I get to the what? So the if we go down, we had one, one, which was zero factorial, one factorial, two factorial, three factorial, down to n minus one factorial. <coughs> Sorry, n factorial. Do, do, do. All right, but more than anything else, I really don't care what this number is. It's going to be big. What is it? N fact, it's going to be zero factorial times one factorial times it's triangular times two factorial times three factorial, that's going to be a really, really big number. But more importantly, what's true? What does that theorem say? If the Ronskin's not zero, they have to be independent. But I assumed that they were, oh, so my set has to be dependent and independent. That means my original assumption had to have been wrong. All right, so... I can't make all polynomials from a fixed number of polynomials. How many polynomials do you have? Well, it's not finite. Well, what's another word for not finite? Infinite. So what does it mean to be infinite dimensional? Infinite dimensional means how do I get everywhere? You need an infinite number of vectors to get everywhere. If you have a finite number of vectors on this, you won't get to every polynomial. You'll miss them. In other words, if we think about it, if you only give me that number of polynomials, it's impossible. If I went from 1x, x squared, and let's say we stopped at x cubed, is it possible to get x to the fourth? No, because I only add. I don't multiply polynomials. I add polynomials. What's the multiply? That just changes the coefficient. You can't get to an x to the fourth. So if you only go up to x cubed, well, what about x to the fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh? They don't exist. It's a subspace. I can't get to those. Well, how do I get to everywhere? You need an infinite number of polynomials to generate all possible polynomials. So that's what it means to be infinite dimensional, non-finite. So we call such V infinite dimensional. All this means about a space is how many primitive, if we normally we think about it like the basis vectors, like this idea of a primitive set of vectors that we add and stretch to make everywhere. How do I generate all my objects? I need an infinite number of objects to generate all my objects. But in R3, how many do you need? Three. In R4, how many do you need? Four. It's only the fourth dimension. Um, there's a philosophy of math problem here in this, which is the following. Axioms are those things that you must accept to be true. All right. All of math is built on the following things. Statements, words that it cannot define. They just are. Like a point. What's a point? It's a point. What's the number one? It's the number one. I can't define it. We all know what it is. I can't define it. There are statements that are true that I cannot prove, but I know that they're true. Those are called axioms or postulates, the axiomatic theory. All of math starts with that, things that simply are. You know when I tell you the truth, and you know when I lie to you. So the thing that there is such a thing as a truth and a lie, it's just axiomatic, right? They're undefined. They just are. The question was, for mathematicians, is all of math is really built from those statements. Right? How do you prove something? Well, I take things that are true, I start off with things I assume to be true, and I put together with logic and I make a more complicated statement. Like these things, like theorems. Those are things I can show to be true. But way down at the bottom is these assumptions that I just accept. 
And the question was, is there a finite number of truths that I have to accept to make all of mathematics? In other words, I only need a certain number of axioms, and then everything will just, okay, then it all just builds, and we make this wonderful world of mathematics. Well, this is a simple example. If your entire world is just functions, if functional space, like this, polynomials, is infinite dimensionals, and that's actually just simply part of math, that immediately tells you what, well, how many axioms are you going to need to handle all of everything that you could ever do with math, how many axioms are necessary? An infinite number. So math itself is, in a way, infinite dimensional. So you just have to have this thing given. In other words, we're stuck. <laughs> it's like, what can you build? Only, oh, you know, we only work with finite stuff. So it, it has its limit. Okay, so these bases are obviously important. How many vectors there are in any particular basis is the dimension. So if you have V of a dimension N that is strictly greater than zero, then, so I'm not including the vector space of only the origin. <laughs> it's like more than that. It's <laughs> like one and up. Uh, actually, uh, if you go into real analysis, you'll start to ask questions about dimensionality and they'll do things like, well, could you be in one and a half? You know, things like that, which obviously has to leave that it doesn't make, make sense because bases are either one or two or three. Or z zero is just a zero object, but then one, two, three has to be a, a counting number. And then there's different approaches to that to try and figure out, you know, based on an idea of measure. But if we have dimension that's larger than zero, then one, any set of n. vectors that are linearly independent span V and form a basis. So if you already knew the dimension, it'd be like, hey, um, if the dimension's five, if any set of five vectors that you could show linear independence will span the entire set. I don't even have to do the work. In other words, all this work back here that I did to check to see if it's a spanning set, it'd be like, if I just simply knew already that R3 was dimension three. Since it's dimension three, you don't, have, you don't even have to check spanning. You just have to check linear independence. Three things, linear independent, basis, span. Why? because I already know that it's dimension three. So I just need three guys who are linearly independent, and I have th therefore found a basis that spans the entire space. So that's nice. So if you already have knowledge about the space, it allows you to not have to do, hey, let's check spanning, let's check independence. It's like, no. You have three, it's three, you're good. Just check for independence. The second, is any spanning set of n vectors are linearly independent and form a basis. So again, like that problem I just showed, I did two things. I checked for independence and I checked for spanning. What this really says is if you already knew the dimension, just do one of those. If you check for independence, which is if it's normal space, like R4, and you're just having numbers, you, oh, look, it's square. Let's just use the determinant. It's more complicated, right? It's polynomial space or continuous functional space or matrix space. Then you have to do a little more work. Uh, you get your choice. Check spanning or check independence. If you get the one, the rest follows. And you've actually found a basis. That's the typical use of this theorem. Um, the second is a different theorem. Again, 
the dimension of your vector space is n, which is again, we're not talking about the zero subspace. It has to be one or more. One, no set of m vectors with m less than n span b. Again, the basis, the number of elements in a basis are unique. And so if you know the dimension, if you don't have enough vectors, it's impossible to span. Obviously with this we already knew that if m was greater than n, what did we know? These vectors are going to have dependence. <clears throat> what we can then do with these two pieces of information is the following. One, you don't have enough vectors. So what could you do? I could make a basis by adding enough linearly independent vectors until I get the right amount. So if it's fifth dimensional space, but I give you three, what do you need to do? I need to add two linearly independent vectors, and now I have a basis. What if I have dimension five, and I hand you eight vectors? What do you know? There's dependence. So what could you do? Remove dependence, but there's always the possibility that you cut down until they're actually less than five. It's like I give you, I gave you three, but then I gave you another five that are all dependent. Like, ugh, yeah, you gave me eight, but those five are worthless, and so three and then I'll pair up. It's called the idea is that you can add vectors to make a basis, but you also can pair down and possibly add to make a basis. So the idea is, is that if five is your special number, you have two, two few, add independent. <coughs> if you have too many, get rid of the dependent ones, and then until you get a basis of some sort. All right, that's it.